Hey guys, let's talk about um, our third part of this series, which is going over speech and swallowing issues that happen during a stroke. So what kind of speech issues happen? There's what's called aphasia, which is issues with either expressing or receiving communication. Um, and this is a brain problem. They cannot get the messages or they cannot send the message because of the lack of blood flow to that brain area. So it depends on, of course, where their stroke occurred. Um, and then there's dysarthria, which is issues with articulating. See how I am articulating these words? I can do that because the muscles in my face are working properly, but people that have had a stroke cannot articulate. So um, some of the, like the words we'll have them say is tip top 50, 50. And if you look at my mouth and watch the, that come out to try to say those words yourself, you have to articulate them. So um, definitely uh, feel free to kind of practice that to kind of see like, what words do I actually um, are harder to say? You have to have good tongue muscles, facial muscles, um, you know, and the muscles in your mouth have to be working right for you to be able to say those words clearly. And that's what dysarthria is. It's a muscle problem because there's weakness because of the stroke. So let's break down aphasia. So aphasia can come in three different varieties. There's what's called global aphasia, which means they are entirely mute. They cannot say any words, they cannot express themselves. And a lot of times they're not receiving messages either. Then there's what's called expressive aphasia and receptive aphasia. So expressive aphasia think they cannot express themselves, but they understand, apparently I understand what's being asked. <laughs> Don't mind my grammar there. Um, and then there's also receptive, which they cannot receive messages correctly, but they can express themselves. But when they do express themselves, it doesn't make sense. So let me kind of break this down. Someone who has expressive aphasia, they're not going to be able to get words out. They cannot express themselves. So they're going to sit there. You ask them a question and say like, what is your name? And they might be able to say their name, but it might take them a while. They might sit there and be like, um, you know, like it might take them a while. And you, you know, like the, they might just kind of like start saying, um, yeah you know, um, and like they're wanting to say something, but they can't get it out. Some people with expressive aphasia, they can only say like one word. I had um, a patient one time that had expressive aphasia that the only word she could say is yeah. And so you had to kind of go off of it. Like you'd be like, what's your name? Yeah. And then are you okay? Yeah. You know, are you having a good day? Yeah. You know, like everything was yeah. And that's the only word she could express. And so some of these patients, they don't have as many words or um, they just really struggle. When you ask them a question, it's going to take them a little bit longer and it's going to be broken up. So like if you ask them, like, what are you doing today? Um, they might say mm, going um, mm, outside, like they, they kind of break it up, like they cannot express themselves in full sentences. Um, whereas receptive aphasia, this is also known as fluent aphasia. For them, they're not receiving it. Whatever question you're asking, like it's not computing in their brain. And so they can talk just fine. They can sit there and talk nonstop. That's very fluent. They're like going and going and going, but nothing they say makes sense. So this patient, you like, you ask them, what are you doing today? And they might say, mm, on a Tuesday at the fish house, I'm going to go blue. And you're like, what? Like, what do they just say? So they can talk, but whatever they're saying doesn't make sense. So these are kind of the two types. Expressive, where I have the thoughts in my head, but I can't get them out. And they come up in kind of broken words or phrases. Or receptive, where, um, you know, I can express myself, but it doesn't make sense. I'm not receiving the message you're giving me. So, I mean, I've had patients that have receptive aphasia where I'm like, um, you know, hey, I mean, they call on their call line. Hey, how can I help you? And they're sitting there, they're like, it's blue on a Tuesday at night. And I'm like, they're screaming at me and they're getting really angry. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, what, what did you say? And so like, they'll ask it over and over and over again. And really what they're trying to say is I need to go to the bathroom, but that doesn't sound like that to me. <laughs> so um, it can be very, very hard. And you can imagine for both of these, they can get very frustrated. So what's my role to help with speech issues? I wanna use alternative communication techniques. Um, so, uh, you know, things that are going to help support the patient. There's devices and other aids that can be used like I have down here farther, like communication boards and things like that. I wanna use short, simple sentences and maybe ask more yes, no questions to make it easier on that patient. I wanna to talk to the patient at an adult level with normal volume and normal tone. 
Um, I do not want to talk down to this patient. I'm not treating them like a child. They're not stupid. They're not misunderstanding me. There's literally something going on in their brain that's preventing them from expressing or receiving my message correctly. So I need to talk to them on an adult level, um, normal volume and tone and normal pace, um, you know, but, um, you know, give them some more time in answering. Um, you know, uh, you want to take your time and be very patient with them, especially with those with expressive aphasia. Um, they're going to, you know, struggle with expressing themselves and sometimes they can express themselves eventually, but it's going to take more time. So a lot of patience is going to be needed and don't force communication. You know, if a patient's really struggling, um, and they're not really, um, you know, uh, wanting to communicate, we're not going to try to push them or force them into that. Um, the communication aids, using gestures is super helpful because a lot of times, even if a patient cannot um, express themselves verbally um, through gestures, things can make sense. So even if, I, if I'm asking a patient that has receptive aphasia, like, hey, do you need to go to the bathroom? And they don't understand that message. If I point to the bathroom or show them a picture of a potty, that might help them um, to better understand what I'm trying to ask. Um, so usually spoken and written language are effective. So I know a lot of um, students will be like, oh, well, I'll just have them write down what they need. But here's the thing is if they can't express themselves verbally, a lot of times they can't express themselves written either. It just depends on the patient, but a lot of times that written language is affected too. So we can't just go to that, like usually using gestures, the short, simple sentences, yes, no questions, communication boards, those are going to be more helpful. And also don't interrupt the patient. A lot of times, especially with expressive aphasia, you have to have a a lot of patients. It can take them five minutes to get out a simple sentence, um, but don't interrupt them. Don't try to finish their sentence for them. Um, you know, allow them to express themselves. So let's talk about swallowing issues. So the swallowing issues that can happen, the main one is what's going to be called dysphagia. And this is what another word for difficulty swallowing. Um, they can have issues because of the weak muscles. So think of the dysarthria um, where they can't articulate. Um, this is dysphagia and it's because their muscles in their mouth and their throat and their tongue are not um, strong. And so they can't swallow and process food the way that they're supposed to. They have weak throat muscles, so they can't swallow. They have weak face muscles, so they can't chew. They have weak tongue muscles, so they can't um, get food where it's supposed to go. And they can do what's called pocketing. So, you know, if they have um, weakness on the right side of their face, they're going to pocket food there. In other words, they're going to like get like a bunch of food. They don't have um, strength on that side. So a bunch of food is going to get stuck on this side. Or if they have left-sided weakness, um, then they're going to get it stuck on that uh, left side. And I think I'm doing it backwards, but hopefully it's, um, you're, you understand and ref, uh, left versus right, hopefully, but you get it. Um, they also can have a loss of their gag reflex and they're gonna be at higher risk for aspiration. Um, so we really want to watch them closely, do frequent respiratory assessments, and make sure that they're ready for that. They can also have a decreased level of consciousness with their stroke, which puts them at an even higher risk for aspiration. So let's talk about what I'm going to do as the nurse for this patient. Um, I'm going to do a swallowing evaluation. It needs to be done by me or speech therapist prior to giving them any intake. I'm not going to just start giving this to them. I need to check for a gag reflex first. Um, they need to be a he their head of bed needs to be elevated in high fowlers, or they need to be up in the chair to eat. This means they need to be really high, not just leaning back 30 degrees. I'm talking about high fowlers, 60 to what you call it, um, 90 degrees up in the chair, they need to be upright for their meals because they're such a high risk for aspiration. A lot of these patients are gonna need thickened liquids to help to prevent them, um, to make it easier to swallow. Thickened liquids, they don't taste very good, but they um, are going to prevent, um, put you at a lower risk for aspirating. Um, they may need a different consistency of their food. Only a speech therapist can make that um, decision, but they're going to decide whether, um, you know, based on their mouth strength, what kind of consistency of the food is best. Um, we want to place the food on the unaffected side of their mouth. So if I have weakness here on my left side, I need to put the food on the right side because they're not going to be able, they're going to just get that pocketing or get, it's going to get stuck on this side. So I always want to put it on the side that's not weak. So I want to put it on the strong side. Um, good oral hygiene is key, um, and they may need to use adaptive devices for feeding to give them as much of that self-care as we can and that independence. I want to give uh, a supportive eating environment, one that, you know, the smells um, and um, 
um, general setup is uh, going to support them to want to eat. A lot of patients with stroke can struggle with appetite. They can struggle. It's so much work to eat. It's so hard that they're not going to have as much um, desire to eat. So we want to make it as pleasant as possible. And then, like I mentioned, a regular respiratory assessment uh, looking for complications. So that's overall what you need to know for, um, you know, understanding the basics of what uh, swallowing issues and what speech issues that patients can have. There's obviously a lot more than this, but this will hopefully break it down to kind of get you started to see what are some of those big issues that these patients are having so that we can take good care of them and prevent complications. See you next time.